This is Sermon Study 4 in our series, The Finale, Letting Go and Letting God. Letting Go. Our scripture reading is taken from Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13, which reads, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. This week, as we conclude our Sabbath study series entitled, Letting Go and Letting God, we pick up from last Sabbath study, Letting Go and go from there. As you know, we talked primarily about what starves the flesh, not allowing it to feast on the works of the flesh, which Galatians 5 details. But we also hinted that even good things done with the wrong motives also satisfy the lust of the flesh. Today's study is an amazing study in that it reveals to us that the food that feeds the human spirit is both manufactured and delivered by the Spirit of God. Let's talk about it. But before we do, please join me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, today's message, entitled Letting God, indeed ought to be the desire of every heart, of every listener to this presentation. It ought to be, dear God, our heart's cry, because as so many have testified, it is so easy to receive a command to go to war, or to climb a mountain, or to do some great endeavor but the surrender of self to you is the hardest battle, the greatest struggle that has ever been waged. And so today, Heavenly Father, help us to get a glimpse of what it means to let you. As we listen, dear Father, things may be said that are new and strange, but God, help us to be noble Bereans, to go back and to research and to study and see if these things are so. Father, we ask you now, by your Spirit, to indict the words, Lord. Come through this message, come through this messenger, and speak directly to your people, dear God, we pray. Father, bless this Sabbath day, and whatever day it is that your people are listening to this message, dear God, Father, may they have a beautiful experience so that when this message comes to them, O oh God, that it will just highlight all that they've been going through. And now, Father, I commit this message, the start of the teaching, into your care and keeping, that doing right well, that your work is perfect, I leave it up to you, dear God, and just surrender as a vessel for you to direct your message to your people, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. So you've often heard it said, even by me, that prayer, Bible study, church attendance, and witnessing for Christ are some of the things that feed the spirit and starve the flesh. But as we grow in Christ, the more he reveals to us. Take, for instance, this passage of scripture. This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Matthew 15 and verse 8 speaks volumes doesn't it? In fact, it shows us clearly that just because the mouth and lips can and do produce some good singing and words of praise, the heart may not be in tune with God. You know, sometimes we think that just because a person sounds well in their singing or in a way that they're able to express a thought, a testimony, even that while they must have a deep heart connection with God, but the Bible does not, and it cannot and will not testify that lip service is what is needed. As we are further speaking on behalf of God, puts it this way, that we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64 and verse 6. Again, another telling passage, considering that it is speaking to acts that are constituted as right doing. In other words, we talked about prayer, Bible reading, church attendance, witnessing. But the thing is, what we do, we bring these things before God and say that this is what I can do and this is what I have done to grow the spirit, to nurture the seed that you planted within me. See what I have done? 
and this is the offering I bring to you. Sounds familiar? We'll talk about it a little later. But with these scriptures as backdrops, can you see then that as stated earlier, only that which is manufactured and delivered to us by the Spirit is acceptable? Let us prove this from the Bible. Faith is something we exercise, correct? But it is said to be given to us as a gift. For proof, see Romans chapter 12, verses 5 through 6, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, and Hebrews 11, 1 to 6. In Luke 17, 5, we see the apostles ask Jesus to increase their faith, showing that indeed it does come from him. If they ask him for an increase of it, they do acknowledge that it comes from him. All the things that we do, prayer, Bible reading, church attendance, witnessing, etc., are tangible material acts that produce intangible spiritual results. The things of the spirit are intangible and spiritual, but do produce material results. In other words, the topic that we're looking at today, letting God, letting God do the work in us, it's a spiritual work. It's a work that involves us surrendering the mind to his Lordship and allowing him to infuse it with good thoughts. Again, one of the scriptures that we started with and which actually should be conveyed as a very important scripture to our study. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And I must say this because this is something that I learned very profoundly this week, that in this experience of letting go and letting God, you as a believer must take away from your vocabulary and indeed your experience the thought of trying to let the mind of Christ be in you. I am trying to do this or I'm trying to do that. I challenge you to look to Genesis, to Revelation, and see where God ever asks you to try to do anything. He says, do it. Not by might, not by power, but by His Spirit. With man, indeed, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And so, in the production of the mind of Christ in you, only that which comes from Him is sufficient. It's just like a manufacturer of an automobile. He tells you to put in premium, the best gasoline. He tells you how to treat it. It comes with a manual. And in order for that automobile to operate successfully, it must be done so under those specific instructions. And watch this. Notice that those specific instructions, even though they are intangible, as it were, words on a page, they do produce a material result. The car operates perfectly. So too, if we allow the words of the Bible, as we saw in our previous studies, Philippians 4, 8, most of the things are true. If we meditate on those things, the truth, speaking the truth, hearing the truth, living the truth, it will become part of an experience that will take us on into glory. It will become our experience. We will have no fear of telling the truth when it comes in the defiance of laws that tell us contrary. When we ought to bow down, we stand up. When we ought to stand up under pressure, we will not bow. My dear friends, understand that whatever God puts in within us is for our purpose and it will produce results, I promise you, in this life and there are consequences and the results that are eternal will far outweigh any casualty that comes as a result of us being honest, being subjected to this word. For example, before we go on, Jesus said to the disciples, Go into your into all the world and preach the gospel. The gospel, Jesus Christ himself. Notice what happened very early on in the experience of the disciples. They said, standing before the Sanhedrin, that very same body, that not too long before that crucified their Lord, 
publicly held a mock trial for the sole purpose of legally killing someone who did nothing wrong. And they boldly proclaimed the name of Christ. Why? Because they allowed him, they allowed his mind to supersede their minds. They allowed his wants, his needs, his desires to take precedence over theirs. He allowed his life to take precedence over their living. And so when it came time to whether they will stand up for Christ or bow to the pressure of the Sanhedrin Council, they stood for Christ. I just wanted to make that clear, that these intangible spiritual revelations from God do produce tangible physical results. Feed in the Spirit from the Spirit as we go on. In John 15 verse 4 and 5, we have these words from Jesus himself. Abide in me and die in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing, absolutely nothing. So in other words, sap from the living vine is what produces nourishment to the branches. As we continue to abide in Christ, he feeds us. Notice, in John chapter 6, verses 53 to 58, we have these verses. Jesus speaking, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he, shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So not only does Christ provide the nourishment, he himself is the source of the spiritual food we need for spiritual growth. We desperately need to let go of our preconceived notions and allow God to feed us. What do I mean? We try to feed ourselves by constantly saying, let me get into the Bible. You know, as I mentioned the other day to a friend of mine, one thing that my pastor, Elikan, always says to us as his congregation, he uses this analogy that someone may, in the course of a conversation, say to you, I read my Bible three times a day. And because you know you're deficient in that, you go back and you start reading your Bible four times a day. And so you come back to him and tell him, well, guess what, I read my Bible four times a day. And we think that is what feeds the Spirit. We pray all night, all day, shut off ourselves from the rest of the world and pray. We're in church every time the church doors are open, and we go witnessing every chance we get. My friends, not knocking any of these and saying any of it is bad, we ought to do those things. But, like we said earlier, only that which is produced from God and delivered to the soul is what nourishes our souls. In Numbers 21 and 5, we have this experience of the ancient Israelites. But before we read that, I want to ask you a question. Are you doing the same things as ancient Israel? Are we doing the same things that they did as we point our fingers at them and say shame on them, they ought to have known better? In so many ways, we are. Numbers 21.5 tells us, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and are so loaded this like bread. Notice the irony. They had bread from heaven that they so loaded as they said. I hope you catch it. They wanted bread they could make. Remember they said that's what they remembered most of all from being in Egypt. We'll not touch that too much, but again, remember they said, when we were in Egypt, we remember that we had the best of this and the best of that, what man could produce, in other words. But they were being blessed with, as Asaph says, angels' food, Psalm 78, 25, and rejected it. Again, our condition. Like Cain, we grew our 
crop of wheat. We nurtured it. We made sure that it got the best soil. We made sure that there was no other bees or anything around it. And we grew it from a sapling all the way up. And now we come and present it to God. Here, God, this is what I've been doing twice a day, reading my Bible. Every time the church doors are open, this is what I've been doing. This is why I'm so strong spiritually, because I fast twice a week. I give tithes of everything I have. Well, my friends, guess what? God knew what he was doing when he rained down bread from heaven. He could have given them a five-course meal, but he knew that's not what they needed. He knew that the experience in the wilderness needed this like bread, as they called it, so that their minds wouldn't be encumbered and cluttered with a whole lot of things because their bodies had to digest all of that. Well, my friends, God's ways are always perfect. He himself knows what he's doing. Speaking of the automobile, as we said earlier, because the manufacturer of the automobile knew everything that went into it and what it takes to run it because he designed it so, God, our designer, knows what we need and that's why only he can supply the need. Again, that is our condition. Like Cain, we ignore what God instructs us to do and offer to him the fruit of our own devising. But the Bible says that this will surely destroy us. See Proverbs 131 and 1016 for two beautiful passages of scriptures combined that show us this important principle. God works from deep within to produce the changes he desires. He does not do any superficial work. Notice the following scriptures as we close. Proverbs 16 verse 2 says, All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. That is true. Because of what we bring to the table, we say that this is enough, that this is good enough. But the Lord weighs the spirits. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So as we come down to the close of today's message and to the series finale, Letting God. The message is simple, beloved. Even though we can and do bring all these beautiful things to the table whereby we can say our minds are nourished by, let it be the word of God that ultimately is what we live by. You see, our mind is an intangible thing. And because we are prone, as it says in Proverbs 16.2 and Jeremiah 17.9-10, because we are prone to be such superficial and shallow people, God knows what he's doing when he feeds us with angels' food, manna from heaven, a daily refreshing by his spirit. And if you let him, that will be your experience, that in the prayers that you pray, as they are indicted by the spirit of God, the scriptures that you embrace, every time that you are in church and you have sweet fellowship with the brethren, every time you go out and witness in his name, it is all prompted by him. It's all done through him, and your life is just surrendered to him. And at the end of the day, you can say, I am just and evermore will be an unprofitable servant. We're not any better for doing these things, my beloved. Jesus tells us so, aren't we, at the end of the day, doing what our master told us to do? Friends, let go and let God. Let God be the one to do the feeding and growing of our spiritual life. As it says in Deuteronomy 32, 4, all his work is perfect. Allow God to set the table. No longer set the terms of what the spiritual diet should be and ought to consist of. He who has started this good work will perfect it in you. I promise you, he will be faithful to complete it in you. Let us pray. Father, I thank you so much, dear God, that your people understand now by your spirit that the bread of heaven, angel's food, is what your people need to nourish themselves. When the Bible says, let this mind be in you, that mind needs to grow by thinking on the things that are pure, on the things that are true, on the things that are honest. 
it needs to feed by constantly abiding in the fire. That the sap from that living vine may flow to every branch. Lord, I pray that your people will understand that we do not live by what we can do, eating bread, but we live by every word out of the mouth of God. Because we are so prone to think of ourselves more highly than we are, Father, today it is my prayer that you will help us to surrender all our preconceived notions to you. Father, help us, dear God, if we've been doing things in vain, if we've been doing things with the wrong motives, Father, help us to right the ship, help us to change our course, help us to fall on the rock and be smitten and broken up. Help us, dear God, to be healed and fashioned according to the similitude of our powers. Father, today as we go forward, as we continue, as we embark on the rest of our lives, letting go and letting God. Lord, teach us not to be so self-centered, not to be self-centered at all, dear God, but to be Christ-centered. Lord, show us out of your word great and mighty things, dear Lord, that we will conform our lives to those great and mighty things that will be transformed by your spirit, dear God. Lord, change our hearts, O oh God. Help us to be ever true. Change our hearts, O oh God. May we be like you. Help us, dear God, in all that we do to ever remember that you are God and God alone. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.